Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, witnesses, for being here today. This is most helpful. Uh, one of my concerns is for the Deputy Undersecretary Dean is that I'd like to talk about school lunch and breakfast programs in a different way. And I'm very concerned about the recent reports that cities are opting to remove animal protein from schools' meals. That's very concerning for me. Some might argue that this topic would be better suited for a child nutrition reauthorization hearing, not a Title IV farm hearing, but I disagree with that. This topic falls under the committee's jurisdiction, and we need to talk about it. For years, popular media has attacked animal agriculture and suggested that we cut back on livestock production and related food products in the name of mitigating climate change. These suggestions are very misleading, and climate activists love to blow the livestock sector's contribution to greenhouse gas emissions completely out of proportion and disregard the essential nutritional benefits of animal protein. And this sentiment is creeping into our school systems where it has the potential to irreparably harm the most vulnerable in our society, our children. And I read that for an example in um, Edinburgh, Scotland recently became the first European city to commit to eliminating meat from school, hospital, and nursing home means. I know that's another country, but this similar initiatives are underway in the United States, in some of our nation's largest school districts. In recent years, large public school systems in the Northeast have announced Meatless Monday and Vegan Friday initiatives. School systems on the West Coast are doing the exact same thing. And it's apparent that animal source foods are the most complete and bioavailable sources of protein are full of vitamins and nutrients such as vitamin 12, zinc, iron, and all of which are essential for healthy development in children. And I recognize that Americans have the right to make their own dietary dietary choices, and I want that to happen, but we have to consider what is in the school meals we provide to underserved children who, in most cases, do not get to choose for themselves. The health and well-being of Americans' children should not be sacrificed at the altar of climate activism. What is the USDA's response to these initiatives? And can you explain whether schools that implement these initiatives are still in compliance with the dietary guidelines for Americans? Uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. We're happy to take it. Uh, as you know, we set a high, I think federal law establishes standards and a framework for the school meal program, but districts have a lot of flexibility on how they implement. I'm actually going to ask Administrator Long to uh, jump in with some thoughts, given her expertise here. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one thing I think it's important to, to point out is that uh, USDA directly purchases uh, between 15 and 20 percent of the food that ends up on the plate in the schools, and that those purchases cross a variety of, of types. And I will stress animal proteins are, are quite well represented in the, the foods that we purchase, and those are domestically purchased foods and provided to school. As the Deputy Undersecretary mentioned, School meal regulations and requirements really provide a broad framework for communities and local schools to make choices, such as the ones you alluded to. Some schools also and communities also use that flexibility to make choices to highlight, you know, locally produced uh, items that could include a range of foods produce, you know, produced by local farmers. So the, the choices do ultimately come down to the local communities and the local schools. Thank you, and I just ask that you track that and uh, make sure that it's staying in proportion to what we need. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I think my time's about out.